Are breads, cereals, and whole grains good for diabetics to eat? Were grains the main contributing factor for the autoimmune attack which caused my type 1 diabetes? Are they also to blame for the first known cases of type 2 diabetes found in the ancient world and for the most recent explosion in our modern world? But before we begin, let me welcome all of you resilient diabetics out there. This is the channel we turn ordinary, struggling diabetics into extraordinary, well-controlled diabetics. If you don't know who I am and you are brand new to this channel, I welcome you. My name is Jay Sampat and I became an insulin-dependent diabetic a little over six years ago due to an autoimmune attack which caused the destruction of my pancreas as a result of a severe gluten allergy response. So basically, I am the proud owner of a pancreas that's gone on a permanent and lifelong vacation. So not only am I a diabetic just like you, where we will be walking that walk and talking that talk together, but I do also have a University of Bachelor of Science degree in Nutrition Dietetics, and that does come in very handy in discussing all the intricacies of being a diabetic. Don't forget, you've got to hit that subscribe button followed by the gray notification bell and then click turn on all notifications if you want to be notified when a new Resilient Diabetic video has been published. As with all my videos, this should not be considered personal medical advice. This is my interpretation of the latest research. If you want medical advice, please always consult your physician. This episode is the one probably closest to my heart because I will answer two very important questions for you. Would I be able to look like this now and maintain a low A1C eating breads, cereals, and grains? And second, was it the whole grains I was consuming that caused the autoimmune attack that created the diabetes in the first place? Was it self-inflicted? Stay tuned to the very end as you will undoubtedly learn a lot today. I would love for you to go through your old family albums, your high school, your elementary pictures, and you would likely be struck by how thin everyone looked. Being overweight was something measured only by a few pounds. Obesity was rare. Overweight children? I bet you never saw that. Any 45 inch waist or 200 pound teenagers? Probably not. The previous generations didn't even exercise much, if at all. They didn't even have a gym. And now may I add a dialysis center on every block. Why the explosion of dialysis centers? To treat all the pre-diabetics who will over time become type 2s with end-stage kidney disease. Remember, more than one in three here in the United States is now pre-diabetic. I'm going to argue today that the problem with the diet and health of most Americans is partially due to the breads and cereal based products that we have been sold as healthy whole grains. Our beloved ADA advises diabetics to cut the fat, reduce our saturated fat, and include 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrates, preferably the healthy whole grains in each meal, or 135 to 180 grams of carbohydrates per day, and it doesn't include snacks, mind you. It is in essence an anti-fat, carbohydrate-rich diet with 55 to 65% of calories from carbohydrates. The ADA's doctors and our nutritionists view towards the diet? Go ahead and eat all of these healthy foods that do increase blood sugars, but just be sure to adjust your medications to compensate. I'll put a link to my video on diabetic snacks in the description box. This is where you'll be exposed to some of the scathing realities. The proponents who paid off our governing established institutions starting way back in the 1960s that became the basis of everyone's diet and how these corrupt and manipulated studies affect your treatment and your lifelong expectancy to this very day. There is this beautiful mantra by Professor Robert Lusting that we as a society need to address. You cannot fix health care until you fix health. You cannot fix health until you fix the diet. You cannot fix the diet until you know what is wrong. There is obviously this very big disconnect. What is catching everybody off guard? 
It's not the obese causing the explosion of diabetes, heart disease, and blood pressure issues around the world. 40% of those with normal weight now have metabolic dysfunction diseases. In 2001, a study which was published in Nature showed 151 million world cases of diabetes, and they were projecting an increase to 210 million by 2010. What actually happened was that there were 285 million diabetics by 2010. By 2014, that went up to 422 million. And this is why we are actually trying to do something. What's happening? We're causing the diabetes. We are not treating and preventing it. And at the rate we're going, we're going to bankrupt many nations around the world. Is diabetes something new? Or have we learned a lesson that occurred throughout man's history? Dr. Michael Aid's seminar called 30 Years of Flawed Nutritional Science is one of the most important videos I want you to watch. I'll put that link in the description box below. He used the very latest of stable isotope analysis, a way of looking into how a man ate thousands of years ago and determined their health as a result of what they ate. How long did they live? How did they die? They could also tell the true diet in detail. Was it grain-based? Was it a hunter-gatherer diet? Who was the healthier of the two? But more specifically, what types of foods did they eat? Was it grains, fruits, fish, cattle, ox, or even snails? What we need to know now is that the agricultural revolution of breads and cereals are only around 333 generations long. So that is about 0.4% of our evolutionary years as man. Refined sugars, grains, cereals, and oils are seven generations long or 0.009% of our evolution. The food processing of junk food is four generations or 0.005% of our evolutionary years. 99.6% of all human generations has had no evolutionary experience with our commonly consumed foods. We are the walking and the dying test subjects of this failing science experiment. Take for examples the Egyptians. What do you think of when you imagine the people who built the pyramids? Probably strong, muscular, maybe a little thin, but you couldn't have been more wrong. Several thousand years ago, the Egyptians diet was a nutritionless nirvana. At least a nirvana for the so-called nutritional experts of today who are recommending a diet filled with whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, and little meat, especially red meat. These well-preserved Egyptian mummies that were studied were mostly in their 30s and 40s, not very old by our standards. Discovering advanced hardening of the arteries and diabetes through MRI imaging was really quite unexpected, especially since heart disease was long considered to be a modern disease. Unfortunately, the Egyptians mirrored our society of severe health repercussions. However, they followed a diet based on what was only available. There was no sugar. It wouldn't be produced for another thousand or more years. No polyunsaturated fats and oils, which I have said is also the other major driver of inflammation and diabetes around the world. The only available sugar was honey, which was consumed in limited amounts. The primary staple for the Egyptians diet was a very, very coarse bread made of stone ground whole wheat. The entire society was based on bread making. It fed the masses. Animals were used as beasts of burden and were valued much more for the work they could do than for the meat they could provide. The banks of the Nile, however, provided fertile soil for growing all kinds of fruits and vegetables, all of which were part of the low-fat, high-carbohydrate Egyptian diet. There were no artificial sweeteners, no artificial coloring, artificial flavors, or preservatives, or any of the substances that are part of the manufacturing foods we eat today. The ancient Egyptians should have had abundant health, but they didn't. In fact, they suffered pretty miserable health. Many had heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity, all the same disorders that were experienced today in the civilized Western world. Dr. Aid's video will show you the MRI pictures of the monies, and you'll get to see the arteries filled with plaque for yourself. Based on the mummy data, the ancient Egyptians were not only obese and diabetic, but the men and women had drawings on the tombs 
that were actually fake renderings of themselves. Just like we would want to take that perfect selfie, you never wanted to show your worst side. Egyptians intuitively figured that thin, trim people were more attractive than obese ones and created pictures accordingly. But their three-dimensional statuaries were very, very accurate. Most of the men from the Egyptian era had gynecomastia, which is man boobs. From what? The phytoestrogens that was in all the excessive wheat they ate. When a person eats plant-based foods that contain phytoestrogens, they'll have the similar effects as the natural estrogen produced by the body. That is why many of the males had a female pattern of fat distribution along with these droopy bellies. I'll refer you again to the video to see all the actual statuaries. If you've watched my very first episode, LADA Diabetics, My Symptoms, Signs, and Stories, then you'll know that I suffered as a child from the same issues the Egyptians did when it came to my body. I had that droopy belly and gynecomastia. When I was first growing up, our dietary basis as a family was also very heavily based on breads. It was eaten at every meal, and in my case, it was overeaten. It was actually what drove me to get my degree in nutrition dietetics. I wanted to know why I looked so different. But what was worse, I was also heavily misled by my program. As I discussed in my episode on protein and diabetics, the overriding philosophy was a stance against fats and proteins with a very, very hard push towards grains and cereals. It was not until much later in life when I put two and two together. It was only when I cut out breads was when my body started to really change in body composition. Besides the phytoestrogens, there are other factors to consider. For one, appetite stimulation. Breads and wheat-based products do not satisfy, but instead will leave you wanting more carbohydrates two or three hours later. This will exaggerate blood sugar surges that will trigger even more cycles of heightened appetite. Breads always left me hungry and wanting more. Non-diabetics are usually shocked when I tell them that whole wheat breads increases blood sugars to a higher level than even table sugar or even white bread. It's only until you've become diabetic and you check your blood sugars do you get to see this for yourself. But we've been told it is healthy because of the extra fiber. Well, I've said this before. Once broken down and absorbed into our bloodstream, eating that two slices of whole wheat bread is really no different than drinking that can of soda or eating that large candy bar. If you look at this graph, courtesy of Dr. David Unwin, and I'll put a link to his page in the description box too, and what has the most sugar? The whole grain barley bread with 5.5 teaspoons of sugar. The average 6 to 11 year old American boy consumes 22 teaspoons of sugar every single day and the average girl consumes around 18 teaspoons and where are all those sugars coming from children's cereals and granola bars have the most sugar packing in more than two and a half teaspoons per serving on average more than two keebler fudge stripe cookies and then we wonder why our children are becoming diabetic at such early ages here are some facts for you thanks to ewg Every single cereal marketed to children contains added sugar. On average, children's cereals have more than 40% more sugar than adult cereals and twice the sugar of oatmeal. Besides the exorbitant amounts of sugars in wheat-based products, there's a second more concerning issue, but this does not affect everyone, so we cannot blow this out of proportion. What percentage of people would this affect? I really can't say. And this is one of the complex ranges of diseases resulting from the consumption of wheat, one being celiac disease. This is the devastating intestinal disorder that develops from the exposure of wheat gluten. There could be an assortment of other sicknesses associated to gluten intake, including neurological disorders, arthritis, curious rashes for some very unlucky few like myself. And this is what saddens me. Even though I cut out breads, I was still brainwashed by my nutritional program. Thus, I wanted to meet the upper range of dietary fiber requirements. So, I blindly turned to using small amounts of a very popular high fiber rich cereal, which, by the way, has been curiously discontinued. It was then when I started to develop these severe, unexplained rashes that covered my entire arms. 
It was then over time morphed into very, very painful intestinal pain, followed up by the diagnosis of diabetes within five years. All this was due to the excessive amounts of gluten in that cereal. The gluten triggered an autoimmune attack, which then caused the destruction of my pancreatic beta cells. That is why I am technically a type 1 insulin dependent diabetic. The last decade has seen a surge in gluten related diseases. One source speculates that the possible explanation was the changes that occurred in the gluten rich cereals themselves. Celiac triggering gluten proteins are indeed expressed to higher levels in modern cereals. Sophisticated hybridization techniques have been used to produce new strains of modern wheat, the most high yielding of which have since made their way into human food. But get this, in the absence of any animal or human safety testing first, they found out the dramatic changes in celiac disease and gluten allergies took place when the new hybrid cereals were first introduced into human foods. I will also set up a playlist for you at the end of this video directly on the foods I now eat and why. In the episode Diabetes and Protein, you will come to find out protein may be the single most important nutrient for a diabetic to consume for the greatest possible health outcome. What are the top three vegetables to consume and why? If you're on your desktop or laptop, use that mouse to click that box. If you're on your mobile device, tap that with your fingers. The first is the link to subscribe to this all important life changing channel. The second is the link to the playlist mentioned on foods. So have a great and productive day and we'll see you soon with another new episode, which I said are always released weekly. Bye for now.